maybe a better question would be what what is that notation? I mean, what's that awkward looking symbol? Yeah. Well, what did you guys say about that symbol? It, sum. it does mean the sum of. I thought I heard another S word. Who's into the Greek alphabet? Often the gr it is sigma. Greek letters seem to show up in different places, sometimes, uh, you know, fraternities at colleges, but in mathematics also. So that's the sigma symbol. And you're right, it does mean sum or summation. So how do you find the sum? And what are you finding the sum of? I don't expect you necessarily to shout out the answer to that, but, you know, what do you think? The You're definitely on the right track. Now, it's not, you're going to learn it's not 100 numbers uh, because, well, because of that 7 to 100 sort of, uh, I'll, I'll, it's called an index, although I haven't officially told you that, but the index is 7 to 100. But you're definitely on the right track. There's like give or take 100 numbers. And uh, we're going to have to add them together. Of course, the question is, what numbers are they? Well, that has something to do with 3n minus 13. Okay, now, again, I didn't put this up here to frustrate you, but more to say that in a few moments, we'll know how to do this. And I like some of the ideas that you're sharing. Nice job. It ends up being a sum. It ends up being a summation. Let's go back a step. Let's go back a step. I Oh, uh, yes, well... This actually is the topic if you like putting titles down in your notes. So that problem that was up there, we actually will solve it shortly, but that's a sigma problem. It's, it's using sigma notation, which is also the same thing as summation. We use both words interchangeably. All right, now, um, here's something a little different. Um, and uh, it serves a few purposes. It's going to show you that there is some application to all this nonsense, and it's also to help us make some connections, okay? Actually, some connections from uh, before break, okay? Things that we've done already. There are theaters out there. I'm not an expert in this, but I did a little bit of Googling, and some of them are round theaters, where literally the people act in the middle. Uh, the acting goes on in the middle, and you're seated around. And uh, this particular theater, I'll be honest, I forget exactly, but I think it was in Chicago, probably on like a college campus, um, but it really was called the Theater in the Round. But I know that there's other theaters that are also called Theater in the Round. Okay? There's something special about this theater. It has to do with the seats in it. Let me give you some specs. Now, if you want to copy something down, maybe you want to write down what I just put there. Maybe you just kind of want to listen. This problem is to serve two purposes. It's to show you an application and also to make a connection. So just make sure that you're able to do that. Now, apparently the first row has 10 seats. The next row has 12 seats. And as I'm trying to insinuate, it continues that way until the 15th row. What way? You know, what way is it continuing? Well, to do a little bit of reviewing, you should feel like that this sequence is arithmetic. Okay? If you think about it with me a little bit here, the sequence that's in this problem is nothing more than an arithmetic set of numbers where the common difference is consistent. Okay, so again, the numbers in this problem are really just a set of arithmetic numbers. I'm just saying these things to gently try to remind you of what we've done. And they have a common difference. Now, it's pretty important that common difference is what makes them arithmetic, but it's just the number two. And as we get to kind of the first question here, basically something for us to actually do, we want to try to write a formula for the a sub n. Now, this is a typo. This should really be for the a sub n row. I really need to change that to the row. So in other words, what's a formula for like the fifth row or the tenth row, or in this case, any row? 
All right. Now, thank goodness the test isn't today. That would be cruel and unusual to give you a test on the day you come back to school, you know, like on like a map or something. But um, the test is not today. So if you're like, uh oh, you know, I know there's a formula, but I don't know if I remember it. I'm just trying to gently remind you that we can write a formula for the nth term. Again, in this case, it would be like the number of seats in that row, which only requires a few careful uh, observe a few careful values. The first value is first in that formula. And then maybe this looks familiar, although you might not be ready to shout it out. N minus 1, that's always part of the arithmetic formula. And then the common difference gets multiplied. For some reason, it, it always shows up at the end of the formula, but it's just a number that's distributed which I actually want to do with you right now. We've never done this, although it's not hard algebra, but what if I distribute the number two? Okay, well, yeah, I mean, I can distribute the number two. That's just going to give me 2n minus two. And of course, minus two plus 10, we're just doing like a little simplifying, gives you 2n plus eight. I actually want you to see the formula in that form. You'll find out why in a moment. Now, do you realize what this formula does? I have a little typo up here, so I apologize. This is the formula that will give us the number of seats in the nth row. In other words, it'll give us the nth term of this sequence, the sequence, the sixth term, the seventh term, the 15th term, which I think is actually something we want to do. Now, um, I, I noticed that that was kind of similar to the part of the beginning points. Is that like... It is. I'm glad you're here today because that's the kind of stuff I want you guys to be noticing that what I wrote here seems to look similar to the, uh, to the formula in that sigma problem. Let's uh, continue, though, to make some connections. I want to find basically the 15th number. Do you understand? That's really what we're doing. We're finding the 15th number, a sub 15, which would represent the number of seats in the 15th row. It's not hard math. Everybody can do it, but understand that the formula that we made makes this really easy. So obviously 30 plus 8 is 38. 38 seats in the 15th row. All right. And finally, we have this, uh, we have this, well, we have this summation problem. As you read this, you want to realize, even though it's the first day back, you want to realize that that is insinuating a series, a series, a summation, which is another formula. Now, again, I would imagine you realize there is a formula. I don't know if you're ready just to shout it out, but it's a it's kind of a neat formula because it only requires the total number of numbers divided by two, remember, and then... Um, the first and last number. Now, the first number was 10, 10 seats in that first row. And conveniently, we found the last number. We found 38. I left the letter N here, although, honestly, I'm going to scribble it out now because I want you to realize that since I'm finding the 15th series, basically, I'm adding 15 numbers then it would be 15 divided by 2. Now, you're going to need a calculator for some things today. Um, I share that because one of those things is just to compute this series. I just want to encourage you to compute it. It's kind of an interesting answer. And you get a little more of kind of that wow factor if you just do it yourself. It's not hard math. You're just doing 15 divided by 2 times 10 plus 38, but uh, it's kind of a neat answer, isn't it? It doesn't usually draw too much oohs and ahs, but it is kind of a neat answer, okay? A mathematician had to have been the one that designed this theater, as we also end up with sort of a perfect number of seats in that circle, 360 seats. So what's that have to do with that crazy thing that was on the screen a few moments ago? 
Well, the truth is a lot. Because when you do a series, you are finding a sum. And you're going to learn today that you can also describe that same sum using sigma notation. Now, sigma notation is the notation that you saw, but specifically for this problem, it would involve the following. First, it would use the sigma symbol. Now, um, that is not like half of a Christmas tree, although it, it certainly could go for half a tree. It's also not like a lightning bolt, but it's just my way of drawing a capital sigma. Now, a sigma stands for summation. What we were actually adding together, and here's like the big connection, is we were actually adding together the numbers that came from that formula. Do you realize that that formula described those numbers? And so we're actually adding together the numbers that would come from 2n plus 8 as n is indexed from 1 to 15. So again, let me say that kind of verbally. It's the summation of 2n plus 8 as n is indexed from 1 to 15. Now, what is that? Well, I, I want to try to make sure we make the connection. It's exactly what we just did in this problem. Because if I would plug in 1, and you can just kind of do this mentally, right? If I would plug in 1, I would get 2 plus 8. I would get 10. Now, if I plug in 2, I would get 4 plus 8, which is 12. And so literally, this summation notation is referring to 10 plus 12 plus all the way up to 38. It's literally referring to the same answer. Okay, now just kind of hang in there because I'll show you why we have this new notation. But um, let me make it a little official here that... Uh, especially these three words here, that sigma notation is this. I'm sure you realize that now, but sigma notation is kind of like the whole shebang. Expanded form, I actually haven't used that phrase yet, but expanded form is kind of what it says, which is usually nice. It's literally when you expand out the numbers. Interesting, that's something that we sometimes don't do but sometimes we can. We can expand out the numbers. We call that expanded form. And then the index of summation, I use that phrase a little bit, but the index of summation is going to be this 1 to 15. It basically kind of gives you the 15 numbers. Okay, and those three phrases, those three words, we want to start to get familiar with when it comes to sigma notation. What is this? Like, why do we need sigma notation? You're going to discover quickly that it gives more diversity. It gives more diversity to problems that involve summations, you know, adding numbers together. Now, as a lot of times it's true in math, let's do some problems to help you understand what I'm trying to say. And again, what I'm trying to say is that sigma notation gives you more diversity. This is a very diverse problem. It is the sum of 2 to the b minus b from b equals 3 to 5. It's the sum of 2 to the b minus b from b equals 3 to 5. What that really means is plugging in individually each of these indexes, plugging in b equals 3, finding the number that goes with b equals 3. By doing 2 to the third power minus 3, you know, by actually computing that arithmetic. Now that's 2 to the third, that's 8, and 8 minus 3 is 5. So this sigma problem represents taking the number 5 and adding to it, are you starting to catch on? The number that's connected with 4. Now that would be 2 to the 4th minus 4. Just kind of a little by the way, if you're already wondering, do I have to show all this work? Um, it's up to you how much work you need to show. I'm certainly showing it 
so you understand where we're getting numbers from. This is 2 to the 4th, that's 16. 16 minus 4, that's 12. But I want to make sure you know where 12 is coming from. Because the main thing is that you're going to add. You're going to add 5 plus 12 plus, well, I would imagine you want to find the next number. Okay, and I hope that you calculated 2 to the 5th minus 5 to be 32 minus 5 to be 27. I would definitely recommend that you show, in fact, often I will say you have to show the expanded form because you're going to want to. You're going to want to take C4. You're going to want to C12. You're going to want to C27. And then when you add them up and you get 44, well, that is technically the value of this sigma problem. Sigma notation. It gives us more diversity. What I mean by that is it doesn't need to be just a nice little arithmetic problem, does it? These numbers right here are just kind of random. They're not arithmetic. That's okay. I was still able to find their sum. I kind of have a hunch that you've seen enough that you might be interested in trying to do a sigma problem. How about this one? The summation of 3n minus 13 index from 1 to 4. 3n minus 13 index from 1 to 4. Do some mental math, write some numbers, see if you can find the summation. You should be plugging in one, then plugging in two. Just by the way, you do get a lot of negative numbers. Kind of wanted to show you that that's okay. So we get negative 10, negative 7, negative 4, and negative 1. Okay, when you add those four numbers together, as I hope you're starting to realize, that represents the value of this sigma problem. That represents the summation of those four numbers. Now, there's something else going on here, especially with this problem. Are you ready to talk about it? You've seen this before. You've seen adding together numbers like this. Now, this one's kind of easy because it's just four numbers. But there's something true about these four numbers. There's something true about them. They're arithmetic. They're arithmetic. Why? Okay, so we start to notice this. Maybe we jot it down. Maybe we just say it. But, but, but why is that special? Do you realize that if you have an arithmetic set of numbers, and of course, you determine the common difference. Do you realize that you have another way? You have another way to find the sum. Okay, now be careful if you're saying, yeah, but I don't need to do that. There's probably a reason why I'm bringing this up. So there's another way to find negative 22. And that alternative method is to think of this as an arithmetic series 
I'll tell you what, usually we don't write the word series, we just say S. But basically, to do this problem using the arithmetic formula, which requires the total number of numbers divided by 2 times the first number plus the last number. And it's a little bit of simple arithmetic, which I hope you're thinking about, would cause a student to say that, well, that this is the same answer. Okay, 2 times negative 11 is negative 22. I'll just take a moment here because we're at a pivot point. What I've just shown you is that some sigma problems can be solved using old methods. And some sigma problems that involve a lot of numbers, like the numbers from, or I should say between 7 and 100, may be thankful for an old method. 7 to 100 of 3n minus 13. Look familiar? All right, well, this was this problem from the beginning of the period. And um, I hope you're ready to solve it. There's some things that I would expect that you're doing, but I want to make sure you realize sort of next time around why you're allowed to do it. Like I would expect that you're finding the first number and the last number, okay? Because, of course, that's all this formula really needs is the first number and the last number. Now, you also need to think about the total number of numbers. And be careful. Sometimes this is the only thing that gets kids. Be careful. The total number of numbers between 7 and 100, as you might remember we discussed with a little homework problem, is not 93. It's not 93. It's always one more, okay, because you've got to count the first number. So there's really 94 numbers, and of course that's important. But i got to say, maybe the, the, the thing that's most important about this problem is that you realize that it's arithmetic. Uh, are you tracking with me here? If you see this problem randomly sprinkled throughout other problems, the first thing you really need to say or realize is, oh my gosh, this is an arithmetic problem. And how will you do that? Be careful, okay, because this gets a little into the theory. You have to realize that it's arithmetic either because of the form of the formula. Now, the form of the formula is linear. If a formula is linear, the numbers are changing in a constant manner. Or maybe it's because you did a little bit of this. Now, we did do a little bit of this in the previous problem, so we realized it was arithmetic. But seriously, maybe you would have had to have discovered by looking at a few other numbers before you made this conclusion. Okay, now I don't want to overkill this or overdo it, but... If I find the first few numbers, then I can make that conclusion that it's arithmetic. Okay, we have to be careful that we realize why we're allowed to use this formula, not just because it uses a lot of numbers. 
the sigma notation refers to matrix. I like this kit. And again, as I said before, I like that you're here because that's exactly kind of the next thing to we should be wondering. Can we do a sigma problem? Now, before we move on, is there any other questions with this? I saw some of you erasing some things. That's fine. Did you realize that, that using the formula gives us that big old 13,865 number? Okay, because then we can go on to your question. Can we do a sigma problem that involves geometric? Well, the answer is yes. Um, probably the bigger question here is do we realize why? Take a look at this. It's quite a mouthful. It's the sum of 3 times 1 half to the n plus 1 indexed from 1 to infinity. Uh-oh. We've got this infinity thing going on. Now, just as I was trying to mention the other problem, really the first thing we need to realize is that this problem is geometric. And it's not geometric just because Owen asked, but it's geometric because of the behavior of the numbers. And for many of you, which is completely fine, you will want to find the first few numbers and discover this, like it's, it's part of the package. So I plug in one. Now, before you get too quick on your calculator, that's just like squaring one half. When I plug in one, I get a square. That's going to come out to be a quarter and three times a quarter is three quarters. So we don't maybe need a calculator for that exponent. I would argue in the same manner if you plug in two. Now we're just going to be doing one half to the third power. Remember, one half to the third power is just like cubing the numerator and denominator. So it's one eighth. One eighth times three is three eighths. Now, I probably should go on to the next and the next, but it is true that this problem uses bases and exponents. And when I use bases and exponents, that is equivalent to geometric, as we discussed in that very first lesson, which means that there is a common ratio. Now, that common ratio can always be found by dividing consecutive terms. If you take 3, 8 and divide it by 3, 4, I don't care how you do that, but if you take 3, 8 and divide it by 3, 4, you get 1 half, which I want you to realize is the base because that's the way it works. The common ratio is the base. And these are things that you can notice as you guys learn more about the parts of these sequences. Are you making a connection? I know we had almost a two week hiatus, but the last thing we did, like the last lesson we did, is this problem. It's the sum of an infinite amount of geometric numbers that converge. Remember, r is less than 1. And since r is less than 1, this thing's going to converge. That means it's that, that really simple formula. It's okay to look back at it. We, we saw it on the homework today. It's the first number divided by 1 minus the ratio. It's a really simple formula, and it fits perfectly into this problem. Okay, that's just three-fourths divided by a half. We've kind of done these types of problems before because three-fourths divided by a half is the same as three-fourths times two. Three-fourths times two is six-fourths, which can simplify to be three-halves, so we should do that. I didn't write this, but I said it. And it ends up being maybe the most important part. It's a convergent geometric series, which is very important. It's a convergent geometric series. You have to make that conclusion.
we're going to do one more thing. Just kind of pausing if you guys, if there's something you want to ask here. Okay, sometimes the homework can look a little intimidating because, well, it seems to be a lot of problems, but many of them are just these sigmas where you're like expanding them to come up with answers. You might be using a formula from days ago to be able to come up with an answer. Do you understand that you don't always use a formula? It just depends on the scenario. Now, what I want to do with you guys as a final part of this lesson is a brief look at how we might be able to express some sigma problems. To say another way, we're going to go backwards. Now, going backwards can be challenging. I'm just putting it out there. It can be challenging. Sometimes you need to see the teacher do a few of them. Here is a series of numbers that maybe at first glance look like they're just random. But I hope to show you that we can express them as a sigma problem. Now, what this insinuates is trying to write this thing. So, well, let's start with the sigma symbol. We know it has to use it. The hard part, though, is looking at these numbers and realizing that there's a formula. Just, again, I'm being honest, to realize there's a formula here. Consider with me that each one of these numbers is one away from a nice, perfect number. It's just true. Every number on the screen is one away from a perfect square. Okay, 10, it's one away from 9. 17, it's one away from 16. Okay, that means that there's got to be something in this problem that involves a square. And being one away. Now what I just did right there was just kind of created a formula. I didn't create it out of nothing. I created it out of thinking about squares and being one away. Here's the problem though. It's not going to quite get the job done if I start at n equals 1. What do I mean it's not going to get the job done? Well, if I plug 1 in here, that's going to give me 1 squared plus 1. That's actually going to give me 2. So I have to continue to think about squaring. In this case, squaring a little bit more than n. And again, I know it seems like I'm just kind of creating this, but it's the kind of thinking you have to employ. And it's okay to say, okay, hmm, if I plug in 1, but I really want to square the number 3, then I just need 2 more. And kind of like you guys did for that Rubik's Cube problem. Let's. This also helps us to get the end of the index. Okay, because if you think about 122, that's going to come from squaring the number 11. So what's my last number if I want to be squaring 11? 9. Okay, because when I plug in 9, I get 11. And of course, 11 squared plus 1 is 122. You could. Okay, now I assume that that means we're not doing Mr. Naylor's little n plus 2. And I like that you also suggest that because there are different ways to express states. That's a great variation. Okay, they're both 100% right. I'm going to have to squeeze this last one in. But I do want to show you two. Once again, this, this is a little harder. You just have to see the teacher do some of them and be willing to try them tonight. Because it looks like it's just like randomly 1, 2, 6, 24. Unfortunately, this is not like the same thing as before. It's not like each of these numbers is just something squared. Let me say it to you a little differently. When I see the number 1, I say 1. When I see the number 2, I say Two, three, four, five.
But why am I screaming? I'm not screaming that loudly. Because this is a factorial. You see, a factorial is what happens when you take a number times itself all the way down to one. If you can just maybe hang out for 10 more seconds, I just want to make sure you understand what a factorial is. Again, it's when you take a number times each integer down to one, and each number in this list is a factorial, which means my formula is n factorial. It's, it's an easy formula once you realize, and of course, it's just from one to five. I apologize for the extra 30 seconds, but again, this is a factorial and you're going to see some of these in tonight's homework. Okay. Hey.